you are or anything. So I don't know if you can hear me or not. So if somebody could text me, I would appreciate it. I don't know what I'm looking at. We can hear you. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All I see is my screen. So I'm just going to begin. I think I am recording. Um, there we go. We're going to talk about radiographic assessments. If, uh, thank you for whoever told me they could hear me. All right. Uh, again, this is more of a review of what you already know. You've had a complete um, semester on uh, radiology as well as how to interpret radiology uh, images. So as you know, radiographics, uh, ra radiographs are used with clinical findings to assess the periodontal conditions. So our radiographs serve to identify predisposing factors. They help detect early to moderate bone changes. Uh, it's very difficult to detect early bone changes because you need to have a certain amount of destruction of uh, the calcified structure in order to actually show up on the radiograph. But it helps us to determine the amount of bone loss. And again, it gives us a baseline data of where that patient is at a particular point in time. What is the historical uh, disease process or destruction that's already happened? So depending on who the supervising dentist is or your employer, some dentists don't even want to do a limited exam without any radiographs available because they're only looking uh, at half the picture, so to speak. So uh, you need to remember some of these parameters. You've got your KVP and your milliamperage and your exposure time. Those are the things that can change. Your KVP is the amount of penetration or power of the x-ray beam, the voltage, okay? So I always remembered P uh, for uh, KVP for penetration and V for voltage, how fast are they coming out versus the milliamperage is milli for millions. This is how I learned it uh, because I need to associate and that has to do with number or the quantity of the uh, x-rays being generated. So milliamperage is the quantity versus kilovoltage is the quality. And then the exposure time uh, is the exposure time. How long are those things being thrown at the patient? And right now, um, our machines just have the exposure time really uh, that we can, um, we can alter because the uh, control panels have, is it a big person or a little person? What type of radiograph is it going to be? Is it an anterior or a posterior or a maxillary uh, or a mandibular tooth? So you're really customizing what that patient, the amount of radiation that patient needs. Um, and again, is it a phosphor plate? Is it, uh, is it computerized? Is it a traditional film? It has to do with the amount of uh, KVP, milliamperage, and exposure time. Now, when I was a student, we would bring the patient back and we'd kind of be eyeballing them up and down going, okay, I think you're a big guy. I think you've got dense bone. I think you've got, the and we were making all of our own decisions. Um, it really horrifies me to think about the over radiation that I was probably giving those patients. So we've got film type. Yes, you still need to know about film type. There will still be questions on those silver halide crystals and, and those type of things on your boards. There's still schools and offices in the country that use traditional film. So until they all go away, you will always have to know about it. But film re, uh, remains the most commonly used image receptor in dentistry. I don't believe that anymore. I think it depends on where you are in the country. Sensitivity or speed determines how much radiation and for how long the patient needs to be exposed to. Now remember, they have categories A to F. The higher on the alphabet, the faster the speed is. So F right now is the fastest dental speed film we have. We use paralleling technique, which is the method of choice. It gives us the least amount of distortion. Um, the central ray is perpendicular to 
the long axis of a tooth. Again, it's less, less distortion for a truer indication of bone levels. Bisecting technique, we use bisecting every day. The patient can't bite down all the way on the bite block. They um, have crowding, they have tori that we have to make um, adaptions to. So we are guesstimating certain angles almost on a daily basis. But this, the film is held closer to the teeth as possible. But for bisecting, the patient needs to hold the film next to their teeth. It does cause more distortion and exaggeration of the uh, alveolar bone level. And it's not recommended for true periodontal diagnosis. Bite wings, vertical bite wings are the best to use for the most accurate bone level. Think about uh, your DNH 130. You're at about a plus 10 degrees for your bite wings versus the anterior and the posterior uh, periapicals. You've got more of a steep angle to them. So think about also where the shadows are. You know, when you're standing, remember when you were a kid and you were standing on the sidewalk and you were either tall and thin or you looked like this tiny little person, depending on the angle of the sun. Radiographs do that same thing. So um, we do use radiographs, again, to show past periodontal disease instruction, uh, destruction. They don't really give us any current information on the disease status. It just lets us know this has happened in the past. And it represents a two-dimensional view of a three-dimensional object. So it doesn't give us a true uh, round robin of what's going on around that entire tooth. Now with CT scans, it's giving us more information and we're going into that. You know how I like these charts, okay? This is table 17.1 of your textbook, which gives you everything you need to know. The difference between a periapical, a bite wing, and a panoramic image, what they're used for, what they're not used for. Bite wings can also be taken on an anterior. You can have anterior vertical bite wings. So for offices that are using a, a full mouth series with a panoramic x-ray and four vertical bite wings. Sometimes they will take an anterior periapical of the maxillary mandibular, but more accurate is an anterior bite wing because again, that uh, central ray is coming direct on and you're not looking down or up at a certain level. The benefits and limitations of conventional radiographs. Um, they do show us calculus, but not always, which is quite disheartening when you're working your fingers off, so to speak. Um, what they don't show are periodontal pockets. They show us the bone level, but we're not normally seeing soft tissue. It does not show us the buccal and lingual plates of bone. Sometimes we can see it circling around a little bit. It gives uh, a very difficult, uh, hard to soft tissue relationship to determine. Uh, and it doesn't show us if we've successfully treated the patient. Bone loss, now look at this, bone loss needs to be 30 to 50% loss of mineralization before it starts showing up on a radiograph. So if you're at that 20 to 30% loss of mineralization, it might not even show on the radiograph. So bite wings um, are best to interpret posterior bone levels. Vertical bite wings are used uh, in school for all adults, 18 and over, versus horizontal bite wings. Doctors like horizontal bite wings because we get more information of the teeth in them. But think about those x-rays you've seen um, in textbooks or in private practice, depending on what your experience is. Some horizontal bite wings don't even show you the margins of the crowns, let alone where the bone is. So we always take vertical first, and then if they've got a small mouth, I mean, you can take uh, horizontal bite wings on me and um, see everything you need to see. I'm uh, you know, class one perio, I've got short little chiclet teeth, so square teeth, so everything shows up versus big old horse teeth. Um, panoramic radiology, uh, most offices today will have some sort of an extra oral radiograph that's able to be taken. Years ago, it was just ortho and um, occasionally a private practice office, general office, but then oral surgeons were the ones. But they show the entire dentition. It's a limited uh, periodontal screening for that. 
but for periodontal structures, we really need good periapicals. We want to see what that crustal bone looks like. And that crustal bone is about two millimeters apical to the CEJ. So when we start talking about CAL, when you think about the template for your AAP classification, it's starting at that two millimeter site. So it's not that the bone level is at the CEJ and you're seeing bone two millimeters below that that you're guesstimating, then they're not uh, automatically a slight periodontitis case, all right? Because that's where the bone is supposed to be, about two millimeters apical to the CEJ. All right, so you can see that the CEJ here, you can, you can see it on the picture, and on number four is the crustal bone. All right, so we're looking to see if there is that white crustal bone. We're looking to see if it looks like cotton candy. Uh, is there any bone loss from about that two millimeter site from the CEJ? So we're looking at that interdental septum. We're looking at the lamina dura. We want to see what that periodontal ligament space is to see if there's any widening of the PDL, which might indicate uh, an occlusal discrepancy. We're looking at, is it horizontal bone loss, vertical bone loss, or bone loss at all? The tooth just might be tipped a little bit as it's showing here in this radiograph. Okay, there's no bone loss here, but with the way the premolar is tipped, it looks like there might be. So you're using these radiographs to help determine the periodontal state for your patient. Now this is a maxillary second premolar that's showing a widened PDL, which is showing again that there's some sort of occlusal discrepancy here. This is that widened PDL along the entire tooth and you can see it also on the first premolar as well. Some of the limitations in radiographic uh, interpretation is it does only show us past degree of uh, disease activity, plus you need to have that 30 to 50% loss of mineralization for it to show up. That's gonna be a test question if you get one of the, you know, if you're in that pool, but that's always one of those test questions, 30 to 50% loss of mineralization. For uh, bone loss, you're looking at the fuzziness of the lamina dura. You're looking for widened PDL space. You're looking also for the presence of an intact crustal lamina dura. That white area, does it go also interproximal? Because that oftentimes will represent stable periodontitis versus uh, a crustal lamina dura that looks like a cotton candy. It doesn't have that margin around it. Horizontal versus vertical bone loss. You know how to detect you are um, lining up the CEJs. Sometimes you don't even need to uh, guesstimate what it is. For example, on picture B, the mesial of that molar is that slight, moderate, or severe or advanced perio. Is that a horizontal or a vertical bony defect? It's quite evident. And if you see how localized that is, there's something going on with that tooth because the premolar looks like uh, in anterior to that looks nice and healthy. So something is going on with that one tooth. It might not just be periodontal disease. It could have a cracked root or something else happening. Look at the anterior picture A as well. Um, you can see that you don't have a nice crustal uh, lamina dura. It looks kind of like cotton candy. You can see that the CEJ is here and then you've got bone that's supposed to be about two mil millimeters from there and then from that you have bone loss. So the severity of the bone loss, mild, moderate, severe, or advanced. Is it localized? Is it generalized? So we have what we call blended periodiagnoses or, or um, uh, periodontal status, the patient could be generalized something with a localized something else. So again, we want to be as specific as we can when we are um, defining our patients. So for the type of bone loss, you're drawing these connecting lines from CEJ to CEJ. If the alveolar crest is more than two millimeters apical to the CEJ, there's bone loss. And then you just whether it's vertical or horizontal from there. 
So this is showing you horizontal bone loss. It looks vertical, but you can see how that molar is tipped and it's really horizontal. This is, if this was a horizontal bite wing, look at the maxillary teeth. You're not even seeing where the crustal bone is. You're not seeing where the uh, crown margin is on this uh, second premolar here. So if you always start with a vertical bite wing on new patients, you can always go to horizontal after that if the patient's mouth will um, accommodate it. But this is, uh, for decay purposes, it might be fine for the dentist, but for perio purposes, it's not. You're looking for calculus. Do they show up on, on bite wings, on radiographs? Yes, calculus does, but early deposits aren't fully calcified and aren't seen on the radiograph. So, um, they can appear irregularly. They can be pointed projections, or we can call them wings, depending. When we're seeing a lot of calculus like this, we know that the patient has more calculus than what's really visible on the radiograph. So we're not going to be going, gee, are they a difficulty three or a difficulty four? I don't know. Unless this is just a localized area, this patient's a difficulty four. Patient probably, uh, if there's more bone like this around, it's a four, four. We're not going to have to scratch our head unless it's just a localized area. Anatomic configurations, what is the length of the root, the shape of the root, how long is that root trunk, what is that crown to root ratio, the relationship of the length of the root, uh, and how much is embedded in the bone. Okay, we want about a two to one ratio, we want more root than crown being embedded, okay, to, um, to be able to hold the tooth in, so that's that two to one ratio. We can't see gingivitis or soft tissues on the radiograph. Sometimes we can see mild uh, after it's been established, but you need to know also the word triangulation, and that's the widening of the PDL space at the crustal area. That's when bone loss is starting, triangulation, and you can see it uh, most evident in uh, the bifurcated areas of, or trifurcated areas of maxillary molars. Right, this is showing you slight periodontitis. You are looking at where the CEJ is. The bone should be about one to two millimeters from there, and then there's about one to two millimeters of bone loss for that from there. So um, they don't have the crustal bone. Is it slight? Some might say it's moderate. And you know what? You both are right. What we do is we take a look at the rest of the mouth, we take a look at the patient's age, we take a look at mobility, uh, any <coughs> other distinguishing factors to make that determination. Moderate periodontitis is just what it means. It's moderate. There's a difference in the um, density indicating different levels of bone on the buccal and lingual. There might be radiolucencies in the furcation area. So this is a true moderate. They still have about 50% of the root covered with bone with the furcation here. Severe or advanced. Again, no brainer. More than 50% of the bone is lost. So part of your perio assessment is describing the bone level. So you're describing what's generalized, what's localized, is it horizontal, is it vertical? We want really detailed on that. So even though there's a template there, don't be afraid to put generalize this, localize that. You can add more words to the box. So for the public health, standpoint for radiographs, frequently uh, frequency of radiographs, I'm, uh, it all depends on what the need is for the particular patient. Um, insurances are now allowing bite wings every six months, as many insurances. So offices have gone to be taking more bite wings, which is just really unnecessarily uh, putting the patient exposed to more ionizing radiation than they may, might need. So you always look 
want to look at the frequency and match it to the patient's need. Are they being monitored for something? Is Do they have a high carriage rate? Do they have um, active disease going on that we need to monitor? Or have they been stable? I using me as an example, I am a class one perio. I might have some areas of inflammation. I don't have any bone loss. I've never had an interproximal cavity in my life. Do I need my bite wings every six months? I'm 65 years old. Probably not, unless I've had a habit change um, and I'm starting to uh, snack more frequently or drink Red Bull or, or whatever. All right, so you want to match things up to what the patient needs. And that's where that carries risk assessment comes from. We are using digital imaging uh, in Northern Virginia. A lot of us are using digital imaging. Uh, when I went to the board review up in Pennsylvania, there were still a couple schools that only had traditional film still. I do teach uh, radiation safety with workforce development and occasionally I'll see an office that still uses uh, traditional film. But we're using digital and uh, we're fortunate that we are because there can be up to a 90% reduction in radiation exposure. We get immediate uh, feedback and we can really alter the image to what we need. There is something called digital subtraction radiography and that magnifies images allowing for a detection of really small changes. Two images are taken at two different times and then they're being compared. We do this more in studies. Um, we're not using it in private practice, but it's digital subtraction radiography. They're putting one image on top of the other. They have to be very carefully taken to make sure that all the parameters and angulation is the same. Radiographs for implantology for implants. Uh, we used to use periapicals and panorexes. Now uh, they're going to the uh, CBCT, the 3D scanning. Um, images, but pans are still being used. It lets us know how much bone from top to bottom the maxilla and the mandible have and where the nerves are. But now offices are going to CT scans. Uh, I worked for a periodontist in the 80s who was doing implants and was sending his patients to Fairfax Hospital for a, a CT scan. And he was not looked upon kindly by the other periodontists. Uh, in the area because they thought he was a quack for needing this. Well, now these CT scans are standard procedure. Offices that are needing to upgrade their panoramic machine or that's getting a machine for the first time, oftentimes will opt for the 3D uh, option because with a CT scan, you can still take a traditional two-dimensional uh, film. With it, it just gives you uh, more flexibility but it makes a one to one and a half millimeter thick slice of your areas. And it takes about 600 pictures and it puts them all together to, um, to make one image. So it does have more radiation than traditional films. It locates not only the amount, but the quality of your bone available for the implant placement. We, um, there's cone beam CT scans, which uh, has less radiation. But again, it not only shows us the top to bottom, it shows us how thick is that bone. Because the dentist then needs to determine where is the nerve, how much bone do they have from top to bottom, and how thick of the bone do they have. They need to determine what type of screw form or root form to be placed into the maxilla and mandible. Uh, endodontists are also using 3T scans because it's great for diagnosing cracked roots. We do have a chapter devoted to implants and implant care, both in uh, 142 and in 146. But radiographs for continuing care is necessary for implants. Follow-up radiographs are taken annually, usually for about three years, uh, sometimes every six months for the first three years, and then once a year after that. Alveolar bone loss of less than 0.2 millimeters a year after the first year of placement is considered acceptable. Alveolar bone loss of 0.2 millimeters per year 
after the first year of placement is considered acceptable. Now, this again was done in studies. How are you gonna measure 0.2 millimeters? You can't, but the dentist can predict how much bone loss is going to happen around those threads within the first year. They place that in accordance to knowing where that bone's going to be. So unless you as the hygienist or the office, if you see a patient for the first time with an implant and you're going, oh my gosh, they've got five millimeters around the implant, you don't know if that's was how it's been since the first year or not. So it's always good to see what the pre or immediate post-operative notes were. So what are some of our key points? Okay, we use radiographic interpretation is used to supplement clinical findings. Uh, they supplement clinical findings. We like to use vertical bite wings for the posterior. You can take anterior vertical bite wings as well because it really gives you a clear indication of what that bony crest is like. What radiographs don't show us is the gingival and periodontal pockets. CT scans are being used now for visualizing implant sites. And that is it for radiographic interpretation. So I'm going to stop the share and end the recording, and I will give you another um, link for the next chapter.